master of ceremonies this afternoon is Clinton Hicks. He's a father and a grandfather. Uh, um, the grandchildren are very proud. They ask me, where's Pop Pop? Have you seen my Pop Pop? Uh, he is a formal council person here in Lawnside, and he is our Peter Mott reenactor at the Peter Mott House. So would you please welcome him this afternoon? Thank you. Today is the poetry competition. I want to start off by reading something to you. For the last few years, or a couple years, the winner of our uh, poetry comp competition was, was uh, Lawnside Native, Miriam Aziz. And Miriam, not only did she win in consecutive years, but she also was the mistress of ceremony for, one, for four years. Uh, we're very proud of uh, Miriam. Miriam, at, at the present, is a senior at Columbia University. This is her words, and it's reflections on the value of poetry. What I love about poetry and what has clung me to poetry for so many years is that poetry is not actually poetry. When we are taught poetry for the first time, it's a simplistic nursery rhyme, and yet when we return to it, it has morphed into some stuffy, convoluted, well-structured masterpiece. When I wrote my first poem ever at nine, I wrote about having fun, eating bread, and running around. The next poetry I wrote was about a white cloud. And now at 21, I'm all about spoken word, sarcastic, social commentary, gift wrap, and a loud performance, and riddled with hand gestures. So their words spoken from our past winner, Mary. And I said she'd be graduating this year from Columbia University. I would like to uh, call to the Robson, Dr. Keith Green. We have a presentation, a proclamation here for him. Now he's going to speak to, uh, he's the keynote speaker, he's going to speak later. But we'd like to get this proclamation from the state of New Jersey to him. Whereas Senator Donald W. Norcross and General Assembly Member 
Angel Quintez, and Gilbert L. Whit Wilson as the duly elected representative of the 5th Legislative District hereby commit Dr. Keith Green. Upon his participation in the second annual Jesse Redmond Foster Literary Series, and whereas each year the Longside Historical Society hosts a two-day lecture, music, and poetry series celebrating literary accomplishments within the African American community while honoring Longside native Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And whereas Jesse Redmond Fawcett was an editor, poet, essayist, and novelist, and is considered to be the midwife of the Harlem Renaissance, fostering the talents of such greats as Langston Hughes from her position of editor at Crisis Magazine. And whereas Dr. Keith Green, a local success story, graduated from Camden High School and went on to attend Morehouse College and the University of Michigan where he received his doctorate in English literature. And whereas Dr. Green is an assistant professor of English at Rutgers University, Camden, and is currently working on a piece exploring the neglected and misunderstood narratives of African American captivity during the 19th century entitled Bound to Respect, the Transition of Black Capacity of Captivity captivity writing, 1816 to 1861. And whereas it is altogether proper and fitting for the fifth legislative district to recognize Dr. Keith Green for his numerous literary achievements which mirror the literary excellence of Jesse Redmond Fawcett, now therefore be it known that the undersigned hereby applaud Dr. Keith Green, Assistant Professor at Rutgers University of Canada. I'd like to thank um, President Shockley um, and the Longside Civil Society for inviting me to speak today and for this um, incredible um, commendation. Um, I had no idea that I was being um, honored in, in that particular way. So I um, appreciate your um, comments and your support um, and your love. I consider um, South Jersey my home, um, and I feel like we're on family today. So I appreciate it and um, just love you for um, your support. Thank you. Okay. 
today. Uh, I want to go back to he's working on a book project to Unbound to Respect. And uh, I guess this project begun at Michigan and he was in Michigan and he came on to do it. But I want to also uh, take a chance to acknowledge, you know, uh, his wife, Michaela. And he has three remarkable children, Joshua, Rebecca, and Zion. Okay, I'd just like to re reiterate my thanks um, again to the Long Side Silver Side for inviting me to speak today. Um, I deem it an honor um, to be here. I'm also excited to hear um, the young poets and students who um, will be honored today. Um, it's a real pleasure. Enjoy to see our, our future and the work that they have done as well. I'm also going to acknowledge um, my students and family and friends who have come out today to support me. Um, I really do appreciate that. It's a Saturday afternoon. Um, the Sixers are currently playing. So um, some of you may be torn, right? So I really do appreciate the fact that you're here and not someplace, not someplace else. Um, today I'm going to talk about the poetry of um, Jessie Redman Foster. And um, her poetry has probably not been um, as well received and um, as well researched as other parts of her writing output. So I think that it's an important um, thing to talk about, think about the poetry um, with Jesse Redman Foster, especially in the context of um, a poetry contest and competition. Okay. Um, right now it's circulating, um, thank you for handing them out, um, are three poems by Jesse Foster. Um, the first um, should be Oblivion, um, the next is Dead Fires, and the last one is um, La Vie C'est La Vie. Okay? Um, three poems by Jesse William Foster. Um, we actually began our program by singing um, the Black National Anthem, right? Um, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And James Weldon Johnson, right, um, wrote the words to that um, song. His brother, Rosamond Johnson, right, put music to it, okay? Um, if you notice in the bottom of that sheet, it says that um, the poems are collected in James Weldon Johnson's The Book of American Negro Poetry, okay? Yeah. So Johnson was a really talented figure, right? Um, not just of the Renaissance, but of the first half of the 20th century. And um, we can also thank him not only for the Black National Anthem, but also for collecting um, Jesse Rodney Burton Fawcett's um, poetry. Okay? So I'll refer to those poems as, um, as we go through. And I'll um, make mention of it as time goes through. Okay, so to begin. Many accomplishments define the life and work of Jesse Redmond Fawcett. She was probably the first African American to graduate from Cornell University and was one of the earliest African American members of Phi Beta Kappa, America's oldest academic honor society. Fawcett was fluent in several languages, having studied Latin, German, Greek, and French for now. And she taught French and Latin at a Washington prestigious Dunbar High School for many years. Right? And Dunbar High School is actually the first um, all-black high school right, in the US. Okay? Um, in an era when only 2,000 African Americans were college educated out of a total population of 10 million, Fawcett went on to earn a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and studied for six months at the Sorbonne in Paris. These accomplishments have led at least one scholar to conclude, quote, Jesse Fawcett was one of the best educated Americans of her generation. Beyond her academic credentials, Fawcett is most often recognized for a pioneering work as the literary editor from 1919 to 1926 of the Crisis Magazine. So she was the literary editor, but the voice was the founder and editor of the entire, the entire project. Uh, the most important periodical of the first third of the Hall of Renaissance. As editor, she discovered and nurtured such important figures as Langston Hughes, Journal Hurston, County Cullen, Jean Toomer, and Claude McKay. Her impact was so significant that Langston Hughes identified Fawcett as one of the three, quote, midwives of the New Negro Movement, Ellie Locke and Du Bois being the other two. Equally important, Fawcett contributed several important works 
to the Renaissance. Her novel, There is Confusion, published in 1924, was the first novel of the Harlem Renaissance. Fawcett was, in fact, the most prolific novelist of the entire era, producing four novels in less than 10 years. Neither Claude McKay, Jean Toomer, Langston Hughes, or even Jerome Hurston, who are all more well-known than Fawcett, can claim such a feat. Despite the increasing appreciation for Fawcett's life and literary output, her poetry has not fared so well. It is often regarded as apolitical, imitative, overly sentimental, and uninspiring. Unlike Hughes and Sterling Brown, Fawcett did not experiment with African American folk forms or speech in her poetry. She preferred the traditional poetic language and meters that she had undoubtedly grown accustomed to from her study of Latin, French, and English. As a result, scholars argue that her verse is marred by, quote, stilted diction and cliches. Her poetry has been described as, quote, melodramatic and dreary. Fawcett scholar, Cheryl Wall, and I see her book up there on the table, so please pick it up. I think it's an important um, um, piece of scholarship. Fawcett scholar, Cheryl Wall, sums up the critical consensus when she writes, quote, most of her poems are forgettable lyrics written to honor the seasons, places, and heroes. Okay, so people don't really like her poetry, right? It's just the bottom line. While I acknowledge the limitations of Fawcett's verse, I also think that her poetry is more complex than has been previously recognized. I would argue, in fact, that quite a few of her poems show a complex, if understated, engagement with issues of race, violence, and the painfulness of the human experience. But in their proper context, many of her poems disclose an adamant refusal to accept the social givens of her time, as well as demonstrate a passionate rejection of the white voyeurism that marked the Harlem Renaissance. And I see we have a few um, younger people in the audience, which I love. So voyeurism simply means when someone looks at you, right, as an object, but not as a full person, right? So spectatorship, right? You look at something, don't really get how complex it is, how intricate it is, and simply see it as an object. So voyeurism. Um, much of her poetry appeared in the Crisis magazine, but quite a few more were also collected in James Weldon Johnson's landmark anthology, The Book of American Negro Poetry, published in 1922. Fawcett's poetry set aside the likes of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Alice Dunbar Nelson, Claude McKay, Fenton Johnson, and Georgia Douglas Johnson. Though her poetry has been considered dead and dreary, my aim here is to show the ways in which it can be understood as deeply engaging and even passionate. I aim to show the ways that Fawcett's poetry was not dead, but breathing with life and tenacity. Interestingly, one of her most oft-used devices was the rhetoric of death, which I will argue allowed her to express notions as diverse as criticism, safety, and despair. Okay, so first I want to reference her, the poem on the, on the handout, um, Oblivion, okay? So I'm looking at Oblivion um, first. And it's actually a translation, right, of a, of a Haitian poet, um, Masian Kwaku. So this is Fawcett actually translating um, a Haitian poet's verse, okay? Um, and the poem reads, I hope when I am dead that I shall lie in some deserted grave. I cannot tell you why, but I should like to sleep in some neglected spot, unknown to everyone, by everyone forgotten. There lying I should taste with my dead breath the utter lack of life, the fullest, se the fullest sense of death. And I should never hear the note of jealousy or hate, the tribute paid by passersby to tombs of state. To me would never penetrate the prayers and tears that fiat bring torture to dead and dying ears. There I should lie an island, and my dead heart would bless oblivion, the shroud and envelope of happiness. At its core, the poem is a rejection of false attention and self-interested curiosity. It shuns the gaze of those who would only stare at God to satisfy their own obsession. Reading this poem in its context, right, of the Harlem Renaissance, it is important to note that black artists became international attractions, 
often endured by largely white audiences, curious to see how African Americans lived, talked, ate, slept, and danced. As physician and novelist Rudolph Fisher noted, in the Caucasian Storms Harlem, white visitors overtook Upper Manhattan during the Harlem Renaissance to the point where black inhabitants were displaced from their usual haunts. After returning to Harlem after five years in medical school, Fisher was stunned to see this transformation. Quote, time and again, since I returned to live in Harlem, I've been one of a party of four Negroes who went to this or that Harlem cabaret. And the cabaret was a place of you know, dancing, laughter, drinking, having fun, right? Similar to our kind of modern cabarets. Um, and on each occasion, we've been the only Negro guests in the place. Fisher explains that the white presence in Harlem had reached such a critical mass that now white visitors, not black people, are the main attractions in Harlem. Quote, time was when white people went to Negro cabarets to see how Negroes acted. Now, Negro goes to these same cabarets to see how white people act. The poem is an implicit acknowledgement and critique then of the curious mass of white admirers of black life, whom Zorno Hurston disparagingly referred to as Negrotarians. Perhaps the most famous of these Negrotarians was Charlotte Osgood Mason, who demanded that she be called godmother by her black protégés, and who gave thousands of dollars to support the careers of Langston Hughes and Zorno Hurston. Mason and others romanticized and thereby misunderstood the pain of African American life. Their saccharine sympathy only redoubled the prejudice and stereotypes that made the Renaissance so necessary in the first place. Fellow Renaissance poet Claude McKay voices a similar concern in his poem, Harlem the Answer. Surrounded by a crowd of applauding but almost ravenous admirers, the dancer retreats to the kind of oblivion referenced in Fawcett's poem. And here's a section of um, Claude McKay's poem, Harlem Dancer. Upon her swarthy neck black, shiny curls profusely fell, and tossing coins in praise, the wine flushed boys bold-eyed girls, and even the girls, devoured her with their eager, passionate gaze. But looking at her falsely smiling face, I knew herself was not in that strange place. As suggested by the word devoured, the crowd's desire to hear and see the dancing woman almost consumes her. As a result, she must retreat from that strange place. Similarly, oblivion rejects the kind of fawning adoration, the quote, prayers and tears that futilely bring torture to dead and dying ears. Or, as described in stanza two, the idle, quote, passers by who pay tribute to, quote, tombs of state. Rather, the poem privileges solitude, self-understanding, and anonymity. A space where a person can be, quote, unknown to everyone, by everyone forgotten. If everyone meant the whites who enjoyed slumming it in Harlem, Fawcett's home was just such a haven from white scrutiny. In his autobiography, The Big C, Langston Hughes writes this of Fawcett's residence, quote, white people were seldom present there unless they were very distinguished white people because Jesse Fawcett did not feel like opening her home to mere sightseers or fattest, momentarily in love with Negro life. Which is to say, Fawcett knew all too well how the white appetite for things black and primitive could undercut genuine racial progress. Read right in this light, oblivion is an understated critique of white spectatorship and condescending philanthropy in the Harlem Renaissance. It prefers anonymity, safety, or oblivion to the dissection and violence of the white gaze. Provocatively, Fawcett uses the space and language of death to communicate this reprieve from white inspection. As Sharon P. Hogg has argued in Raising the Dead, readings of death and black subjectivity, the language of death has been a central metaphor in African American experience and cultural production. People of African American descent were understood as non-persons and invisible, and thus death came to signify both a mark of this condition 
as well as a way to articulate and escape from it. Likewise, oblivion uses the figure of death to enunciate a desirable remove from patronizing white admirers. Fawcett's decision to insert the word Haiti, this is back to the title now, next to the title also holds subversive potential. The prolific novelist was frequently accused of using French words and phrases in her poems to show off exceptional education. However, the insertion that Kwaku is from Haiti and not France, for example, is not a fact that is meant to parade Fawcett's mastery of another language, but to express her appreciation for the embattled island nation. Haiti holds a special place in the history of resistance to slavery. It is the location of the only slave rebellion in the history of the New World to result in the successful overthrow of the slave system and the creation of a free nation. And it is the only second republic to be established in the Western Hemisphere, right? the first being the United States of America. When Toussaint Louverture helped to lead the successful slave rebellion that wrested control of the island from Napoleon's France, it sent shockwaves throughout the entire slave system, as well as an influx of Haitian refugees into American ports such as New Orleans. Fawcett's insertion of the word Haiti into the title of the poem claims and honors the revolutionary history of Haiti for blacks throughout the world. As one critic has argued, Fawcett was, quote, a passionate admirer of Haitian literature. Fluent in French, Fawcett's, Fawcett's translation of Kwaku's work is not meant to celebrate herself, but the spirit of resistance and resilience that she saw as central to her people's history. Similar critiques of white privilege and violence can be found in other Fawcett poems. Consider, for example, Dead Fires. That's the second poem listed on your, on your handout, okay? Dead Fires. If this is peace, this dead and leaden thing, then better far the hateful friend, this thing. Better the wound forever seeking bomb than this gray calm. Is this pain surcease? Better far the ache, the long drawn dreary day, the night's white wake. Better the choking sigh, the sobbing breath, than passion's death. At first glance, this poem may appear to be yet another example of the, quote, vague universalism for which critics have repeatedly assailed Fawcett's poetry. The speaker is never clearly identified, and one might argue that in trying to speak for everyone, the poem speaks for no one. At the same time, the use of the word peace in a poem published in 1922, just four years after the end of the radical upheaval that was World War I, suggests much about Fawcett's feelings about the so-called victory that had been won. Dead Fires challenges the self-congratulating narrative that the end of the war abroad meant that peace had been achieved at home. As Ralph Ellison astutely notes in the introduction to his post-World War II novel, Invisible Man, for African Americans, most American wars have been, quote, wars within a war. First, African Americans had to fight the war against America's explicit enemies, whether it be the Germans, the Japanese, the Viet Cong, or the Taliban. Second, they would have to fight the racism within the military machine itself, and or the racism they found when they returned home. The brave life and writing of Ida B. Wells Barnett attests to the fact that as black troops were returning from war, the lynching of African Americans reach all-time highs, right? So Fawcett was literary editor for the crisis between 1919 and 1926. Within that seven-year span, right, 324 African Americans were lynched in America. Okay, so there, there was no peace, right? There was no victory in that sense for black people. Uh, as opposed to calmly accepting such a perverse peace, the Speaker of Dead Fires asserts that she would rather live in an all-out war, and to refer to her language, the hateful fret, the wound forever seeking bomb, than to live in such a counterfeit tranquility. Her sage and learned mentor, W.E.B. Du Bois, encapsulated the sentiment in his influential essay, Returning Soldiers, 
a work that some mark as the starting point of the Harlem Renaissance. In that essay, the boys passionately wrote of black troops returning from World War I. We fought gladly and to the last drop of blood for America and her highest ideals. We fought in far off hope. The essay turns bitter and cynical, however, when it notes that those troops also intentionally fought for, quote, the dominant Southern oligarchy entrenched in Washington. We fought in bitter resignation for the America that represents and gloats in lynching, disfranchisement, caste, brutality, and devilish insult. For this, in the hateful upturning and mixing of things, we were forced by vindictive fate to fight also. Like Fawcett, Du Bois wasn't easy about the allegedly peace, alleged peace that black soldiers would have, would have had to return to. And like the speaker from Dead Fires, Du Bois rejected such a vision of victory if it did not mean the end of the war on African Americans. As the recent and tragic murder of Trayvon Martin has shown, there is still a war being waged on African Americans in the United States. Black people in America do not need Homeland Security to tell them what terrorism looks like. Fawcett's poem records the fact that a peace that is exclusive of African American safety is no peace at all. As opposed to such a bogus tranquility, the speaker would rather live in a quote, the ache, the long drawery day, the night's white wake, than pretend that black people can live peacefully in the context of American racism and white supremacy. The speaker opts for continued pain and suffering rather than false serenity of a racist America. Conscious suffering, then, is the necessary, unfortunate alternative to a nation that does not recognize and treat people of African descent with full dignity and humanity. Unlike oblivion, dead fires reject the numbness of death for the exquisite pain and awareness of African American mistreatment. Read in this way, the poem's challenging of peacetime politics anticipates the violent vision of peace encoded at the end of Margaret Walker's classic poem, For My People. The poem is an awe-inspiring catalog of the pain and trials that have marked African-American experience, anchored by the chant-like repetition of the phrase, for my people. Like a wave, the poem builds power and momentum until it dramatically crests in the final stanza. Let a new earth arise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. With its calls for the wound forever and the choking sigh, Dead Fires attempts to bloody the peace of World War I. It exposes the secret and messy violence that permeates American victory. Finally, Fawcett's poetry is not only valuable for its unrecognized political arguments, but also its deep appreciation for the ironies and absurdity, excuse me, absurdities of the human experience. So see, for example, our last poem, La Vie, c'est la vie, right? And c'est la vie simply means such is life, right? Somebody says that's how it is, right? Say la vie could be a rough translation of that idea that that's just the way things are. Okay, so now say la vie, say la vie. On summer afternoons, I sit, quiescent by you in the park, and idly watch the sunbeams gild and tend the ashes trees bark. Or else I watch the squirrels frisk and chaffer in the grassy lane. And all the while I mark your voice breaking with love and pain. I know a woman who would give her chance of heaven to take my place, to see the love light in your eyes, the love glow on your face. And there's a man whose lightest word can set my chilly blood afire. Fulfillment of his least behest defines my life's desire. But he will not of me, nor I of you, nor you of her. To said the world is full of just like these. I wish that I were dead. Written in deceptively pastoral language, the poem demonstrates and dramatizes a harsh confrontation with the ironies and pain that mark human existence. The speaker is seated to a man she has no sexual attraction for, 
yet she knows a woman who would, quote, give her chance of heaven to take her place. At the same time, the speaker is apparently in love with the gentleman who can, quote, set her chilly blood afire, but he cares nothing for her. In the end, the two sit together, but alone with their lack of attraction for each other. Critics have argued that the male subject of the poem, the you of the first stanza, was none other than Fawcett's mentor and founder of the Crisis Magazine, W.E.B. Du Bois, and that the woman who was madly in love with Du Bois was Fawcett's longtime friend and fellow poet, Georgia Douglas Johnson. These biographical readings aside, what most interests me here is that Fawcett was keenly aware of the quote, Jess, that define human relationships, the way that happiness is elusive and often mocks human beings. Like the love triangle that defines Nell Larson's passing, where Irene Redfield desperately tries to keep her husband, Brian, in tow, though he clearly pines for the affection of Claire Kendry, La Vie C'est La Vie demonstrates, in the words of the famous R&B classic, that love don't love no one. Moreover, the poem suggests that the speaker cannot appeal to any other entity or person to alleviate this reality. Like the migrant workers who are cast aside like so many toy soldiers, in the closing chapters of Journal of Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God, the unrequited lover of this poem can merely sit and watch the universe at work, but is powerless to influence it. There is no God who will come and rescue her, pull behind the curtain, and deliver her from this condition. That's life. Say la vie. As in Foster's oblivion, the only solace to be found is in death. Though that final line rings somewhat pathetically, it also registers the deep pain of experiencing the agony of unreturned love in the midst of seemingly agreeable company. So to conclude, I have several this to say that Jesse Foster was much more than a novelist, editor, or essayist. Her work shows a complex and historically engaged poet, right, which also deserves credit. She was deeply influenced by the political, social, and emotional world around her, and her poetry, just as her novels, essays, and editorial did, editorial did excuse me, repeatedly reflects those spirited concerns. Thank you. Terrorism, 
there's a strange way in which race still operates, right? So people talk about, you know, um, if you're on an extreme, you might see a sign that reports suspicious behavior against our war against terrorism. But what does suspicion look like, right? Who's suspicious, right, in today's America? An example of Trayvon Martin is a prime example of the ways in which um, this language of American nationalism and defense is very dangerous. And not to say that we approve of terrorism, obviously we don't. But there's ways in which black people have been the first right victims of terrorism in the U.S. Right? Um, the Ku Klux Klan war hoods. Right? We did. Right? So um, we shouldn't be targeting poor black people um, as the uh, you know, as um, the targets here. Right? There's a way in which racism right is it, really the issue. Yeah. Yes, in the back. So I just want to know what your thoughts are because it seems the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I wanted to know, you talk about being in the Black Renaissance period, how similar do you see it today being that way? Well, I, th I think there's a lot of continuity. I think there's also a lot of change. I mentioned um, in, in the talk the figure of Charlotte Osgood Mason, right? She was the, the um, you know, benefactress for Langston Hughes and Journal Hurston. It gave them literally, you know, um, thousands of dollars to support their careers. Um, at this point, right, we talk about kind of the modern black artists, right, they own their own record labels, right? I mean, they, you know, they can control their image and the way it's put out. They don't have to run to necessarily a, you know, a white person to, to, to receive funding for their work, right? So, I mean, and we can argue about that in terms of, you know, like who owns Sony, who owns, you know, Columbia and so forth. But Jay-Z is not a slave, okay? He, he's not, um, you know, th these people have more power than probably you or I will ever have. So I'm not going to sit there and pity people who are doing fairly and, and even extremely well, right? So the lyrics that they put out, the, um, the songs that they, that they make, are on their terms for a good level of part. Now, when you're a you know, beginning artist, you get a rookie contract in some sense, you're going to be kind of conditioned by what you can say. But I feel as if black artists today have incredible power in terms of what they can say. And with novelists, with writers, with poets, with um, spoken word poetry, you can control what you say, right? More so than they could. Um, 60 or 70 years ago. So I think there are some continuities. Definitely racism is very much still alive. But I think as black artists, I mean, the fact that I'm here today able to speak to you about Jesse Raymond Foster speaks to the fact that things have changed a lot. And there's still more to, more to be done. But we do have, I think artists today do have more freedom than they had 67 years ago. And we need to use that in a positive way, right? In, in, in a positive way. of African-American captivity narratives. And basically what it does is to say this. Um, when we think about, let's say, antebellum America, we think about black writing, we think typically about what? Okay, let's say a little bit louder. That's what I said. Slavery. slavery, right? We think about slavery, right? That's, that's the, the dominant framework for considering black writing and black life in the antebellum era. Antebellum simply meaning, let's say, from 1830 to 1861, okay, before the Civil War. I'm arguing that captivity, right, and this kind of broad definition of captivity also needs to be looked at in terms of thinking about black life. So blacks were not only enslaved, they were also imprisoned, right? They were also indentured servitude in the North. So while slavery is happening in the South, blacks were also domestics and in some sense almost pseudo slaves in the North. They were also um, captives to Southeastern Native Americans. So the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, um, those five civilized tribes, they also practiced slavery, and blacks were also subject to those systems. Also, um, the numbers not, are not particularly great, but there were also blacks who were captives in North Africa, right? what, what are called Barbary captives. So I'm arguing that we need to think about not only slaves in the South, but also black bondage in the North, um, in the Southwest, in North Africa, um, and in prisons, okay? Um, the fact that we have so many black people in prison now doesn't begin in the 1960s. Right, with Angela Davis, you know, and um, you know, Mary Baraka. That begins back in slavery, right? So they were both enslaved and also imprisoned. And that shifts the way we think about captivity, right? So I'm using the word captivity to get at the fact that not that slavery is not important. Slavery is, is, will always be in some sense, I think, in America important. But the fact that captivity gives us a way to think about um, the black experience more complexly. Okay, so, so that's when I say captivity, I mean that. I mean um, imprisonment, I mean 
to servitude, I mean all the different ways in which black people were, have been sub subjugated, and the way that it still matters now, right? Um, African American women are the largest rising population um, of inmates in, in the US, right? African American women. And that's really, that's really tragic. But that begins in slavery, I would argue. Right, that, that begins in slavery. Okay, the, the last time I'll be briefly to kind of also to stick up for and defend Foss. Again, I, I'm a, a big fan of Foss's poetry. I think it's not, again, you know, I think that you can compare it to Hughes and so forth and kind of pick, pick, your, you know, pick your battles. But also the fact that she's also a, you know, a, 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 a preacher's kid, right? She's a PK, right? Her name was Jesse Redmond Fawcett, right? Redmond comes from her father's name, Redmond Fawcett. So she wrote a poetry, I think, with her father, with her family, and with her position as being, you know, kind of preacher's kid in mind. So much of it seems conservative, it seems, you know, um, not to be so angry as we would like it to be. But probably because I think that she always saw herself as being, you know, a, a kind of good, you know, um, kind of middle class person. And she grew up poor, right, where her values were very much kind of middle class, you know, kind of middle class um, African American values. So again, I, I love Foster's poetry and I wish that more work would be done on it. So this part of my work today was about kind of explaining and defending why her poetry is so valuable and, and important. I, I thank you for your time and your attention. I really appreciate it. Judging how the competition uh, was done by number. In other words, judges never saw the name or the place where the competitors came from. They were just assigned a number and so that it would certainly be above board and fair as it possibly did. So at this time, I would like to introduce to you one of the judges of our competition, persons who have been judging, have been helping us with this for years. Not only does he judge, but he has given workshops. And he's a, a very gifted uh, a spoken word artist with, with just a world of experience in, in spoken word all over the East Coast as well as all over the country. Uh, this brother has, like I said, had worked with us for years. I can remember when we first tried to engage him to be part of this project, and I was given the, the responsibility of getting him, you know. And I was having a little hard time connecting with him, right? So I heard somebody call me, well, he's up to school. Talk about this school, right? So I ran up to school, and he said, he's in such and such classroom. And he was in a classroom reading to the children at that time. So it, it kind of tells you what kind of a, a heart he has for his work in the community and, and among the, the youth. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring up to the podium uh, Lamont, the Napalm Bomb Dixie. <laughs> the judging of the competition was done by number. In other words, judges never saw the name or the place where the competitors came from. They were just assigned a number and so that it would certainly be above board and fair as it possibly could be. So at this time, uh, I would like to introduce to you one of the judges of our competition, persons who have been judging have been helping us with this for years. Not only does he judge, but he has given workshops. And he's a, a very gifted uh, a spoken word artist with, with just a world of experience in, in spoken word all over the East Coast as well as all over the country. Uh, this brother has, like I said, have worked with us for years. I can remember when we first tried to engage him to be part of this project. And I was given the, the responsibility of getting him, you know. And I was having a little hard time connecting with him, right? So I heard somebody call me, well, he's up to school. Talk about this school, right? So I ran up to school and he said, he's in such and such classroom. And he was in a classroom reading to the children at that time. So it, it kind of tells you what kind of a, a heart he has for 
his work in the community and, and among the, the youth. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring up to the podium uh, Lamont, the Napalm Bomb Dixie. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So, um, I certainly uh, feel blessed and honored to be back here uh, once again to help out. And, um, you know, we are uh, in celebration of uh, National Poetry Month, so I think we should all make some noise for National Poetry Month. Yes. And uh, I'm still kind of buzzing off of being here last night and hearing our keynote speaker last night and hearing the wonderful renditions of uh, Brother Nasir and his jazz band. Uh, that was definitely a treat. So I'm still kind of buzzing off of that. Um, and in the same sense that we are celebrating National Poetry Month, we are celebrating uh, Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And in the same sense that we are celebrating Jesse Redmond Fawcett, we are celebrating the um, Longside Historical Society. And in the same way that we are celebrating the Historical Society, we are celebrating uh, the young poets um, who are going to be awarded today. So one of the main reasons why I was asked to be here right now is because as I was um, reading the works of the students and judging them, I kept seeing the same familiar name. Um, this teacher uh, whose face I knew, and I said to myself, I thought, I said, you know what? I said, now, she's been part of this program since I've been part of this program. And as an educator myself and as someone who goes into the classroom and motivates and teaches children to fall in love with poetry, I know the work that she's done to get the students here. So I, I, I contacted Linda and says, you know what, I think, I think this teacher needs to be honored in some way. You know? And uh, Linda agreed. So, um, before we uh, honor the students, let's honor the educator who um, has so uh, diligently um, coached them and inspired them and uh, where's her play? Whoa. Lisa, why don't you come forward please? Give her a nice round of applause. And you know what, if you look at the back of the program, the color copy, you'll see a picture of me handing her a mic. Um, so uh, I'm going to read this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lisa McCoog, teacher of English. That sounds wonderful. I just like saying that. Teacher of English, Triton Regional High School in Runnymede for her dedication in encouraging her students to express their thoughts and dreams in the society's annual spirit of the Renaissance Poetry Competitions, inspired by Harlem Renaissance writer and fellow English teacher, that you're in good company, <laughs> Jesse Redmond Fawcett. Students have emboldened to write and speak out and Audiences have been enriched for having heard their passionate, creative, and inspiring words. Congratulations, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. The teacher of English. There she goes. All right. So, so um, the way we're going to do this is we're going to go backwards. We're going to start with um, honorable mention and work our way up to um, 
high school level. So, honorable mention. Katie Napolitano. Uh, the title of the poem uh, was He Who Was Powerful. Uh, and she's from John Paul II Regional School, um, Stratford. Honorable mention. Is she here? No. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Maybe she's nearby and she can hear the applause. Rebecca Springle. The title of her poem was Speaking Truth to Power. Oh, wait a minute. All of these students are from John Paul II Regional High. So I'll say the names. Um, Rebecca Springle, Shannon Ward, Erica Frick, and Brody Gallagher. I think Brody is here. Am I right? Are, are any of those students here? Uh, come forward, please. Let's, let's give them a nice round of applause. Okay, so, so who do I have here? I'm Rebecca. Rebecca and Erica. Erica and Shannon. Shannon and Brody. Brody. Okay, all but one. Okay, so Erica, here's yours. Turn around so the audience can see your pretty face. And Brody, here's yours. Turn around so the audience can see your handsome face. And uh, Rebecca, here's yours. And Katie. Katie, oh, and uh, Jen. <laughs> here's yours. Take a bow, people. Thank you very much. Um, oh, yeah, are you, who's reading? Are you all reading? Okay, well, come on. Let me move this out of the way, and you can have that. Thank you. And I'll get out of your way. And you know that mic, you really have to hold that mic close, as, okay. like as close to your mouth as possible. Take pride in your power. Power seems to provide a thrill, having responsibilities that you will need to fill, requiring jobs that you will need to take, always being truthful, never fake. Those being led need a sense of calmness, so always be sure to fill your promise. Listen carefully to each important thought by using the skills that you have been taught. Do not allow power to go to your head. Let it be the guide for your heart instead. Followers will be looking for you to example, for always, so always make sure that your advice is good and ample. Be ready and prepared during times of distress you will be followed by reporters, the news, and the press. So my leadership advice is simple and plain. Be true, an intent listener, and never become vain. Hello, can you hear me? The holders and the hell. The ability is put into responsibility by politicians who've gained national fame. Some try to get power, some try to gain wealth, and sometimes it can be quite a shame. Many people will say that they are right for the job when really they are fully incorrect because it takes a strong leader who knows what they're doing to keep our country erect. The holders of the power must know how to treat the held or misery and rebellion can erupt. Rebellion will spread itself and that is just the thing that can make our good country turn corrupt. We must learn while we are young and open to new concepts how to recognize a good politician. We can learn from our experience which people can move up to the top or presidential position. I finish this by saying that we must not be corrupt and must use power for the benefit of others. As far as I know and from what I've been taught, God's people should be kind to one another. Not everyone can be kind to everyone, but I think that everyone should. But every single person can be kind to all people by using their power for good. Thank you. The name of my poem is um, Speaking Truth to Power. Power, control and influence is the definition. In a perfect world, it would always be used for good, but many times power can create friction. Sometimes power is used for evil. In instances such as this, it can cause quite an upheaval. I believe that power should be used for the good of the people. 
Those who hold the power should help, serve, and guide. They should also unite instead of conquer and divide. Power shouldn't be used as a weapon. Instead, it should steer people in the right direction. I suppose that everyone in a way has their own power. The power to love and forgive, the power to be yourself, but most importantly, the power to decide between right and wrong. If we all choose to use this type of power, together we can stand strong. If power is given to the right people, it can make this world a lot more peaceful. Today, gaining power can sometimes prevent us from seeing what is truly important. Enjoy life because it is wonderful. Um, my poem is called Power Over People. Who has more power? Is it the man born into power? The man who abuses authority? The man who ignores the poor and unfortunate and gives money to his wealthy friends, the minority? Or is it the man who worked to get to the top? The man who is kind, magnanimous, open-minded, and fair? The man who several people respect and follow because of his dedication and care? What if these men share the same amount of power? They only contrast on how they use it. But those who have power over people need to be responsible and know their limit. Power over people, is it because of wealth, of popularity? It seems as though finding a powerful leader with good qualities is a rarity. With great power comes great responsibility. This good leaders know. They are respectful, trustworthy, and confident, and have their followers to show. All right, thank you very much. So for the purpose of recording, I was told, for the remainder of the students who come forward to read, please um, say your name and the title of your poem, please. All right, so um, I am moving towards um, fifth grade. And there's actually only uh, one uh, winner, uh, Jabari Higgs Salam. Longside Public School. Ah, oh, there he is. Wow. This young man is sharp. You ready, huh? Yep. All right. <laughs> Say your name and type your phone. My name is. Oh. Hold the mic close to your mouth. For you. My name is Jabari Hicksalong. Power of leadership. Men and women can all be powerful. Dr. Martin Luther King had a dream for integration, even though he was scorned by the nation. Or Mary McLeod Bethune, who influenced presidents, she founded a college for the African Americans to seek other knowledge. Power is bad when used for, by infamous people, men like Adolf Hitler. His hatred of the racist made Jews live in horrible places. Or Joseph Coney, who did not tell the truth when he stole the innocence of youth. Power should not be stolen or bought. Power is from the hearts of people. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you very much. Take your poem. So um, it may seem like up here you can't hear yourself on this mic, but students, just make sure that you speak as close to the microphone as possible because they can hear you in the back, but it seems like you cannot be heard here. All right, so, all right. Yeah, he's dressed rather sharply there. I like that sweater, too. Might, I might can fit that. Sixth and seventh grade. Um, third place, um, representing Olsen Middle School. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> third place, uh, representing Longside Public School, Tamir Robertson. All right, Tamir, come here. Another dressed up young man. You look mighty sharp and handsome. Name and title of your... 
My name is Tamir Robertson. So tell me, what about the boy that the girl go man? Mr. President, principal, teacher, police officer. My uncle used to tell me this world doesn't have nothing to offer you. Don't you see all the changes everybody's going through? We got our problems and they got theirs too. As I sit back, being 13, I'm wondering, where do I go? Either they think I'm out there selling drugs or out there being strong. For some of my boys, there's only two places to go, the moor or the pen. For others, school is an option and being a basketball player is an alternator. Either path we choose, we are surrounded by distractions, obstacles, and haters. We are so confused and we want so bad to believe in something. Instead, they promise us the world and give us nothing. The more we want change, the more things stay the same. Mr. President, principal, teacher, police officer, do you feel my pain? What are your motives and thoughts on the matter? You see, I live in Longside, where we're surrounded by fake gangsters and school bullies who are actually scared themselves, scared of the same things I fear. No one listening, no one caring, no one taking the time, being threatened, hit, and pressured. What we are telling, Mr. President, principal, teacher, police officer, I'm practically yelling, but no one pays you any mind. Help me, show me, protect me. I want a house, car, good education, and finer things for my future family. But Mr. President, will you help me? Principal, will you guide me? Teacher, will you direct me? Officer, will you protect me? Or will my destiny be one or two options? prison or the grave. Because if that is true, the only reason I'm going to school is to make a decision if the inside of my coffin should be red or blue. Seriously, just let me know right now, Mr. President, principal, teacher, police officer, how are you going to hold yourself responsible in regards to this young black boy's pain? Or are you just going to turn your back on me like those police did in Florida when Trayvon Martin was recklessly slain. Never mind, forget what you're gonna do. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be like Harriet and run to freedom, like Martin and continue dreaming, and my man R. Kelly by Keep Believing, I Can Fly. Okay, wow, wow. Surrounded by fake thugs and, and bullies. Whew. Okay, um, second place, Longside Public Schools, Mr. Amir Abdul Jalil. Ah, oh, here he is. Hello, my name is Amir. My name is Amir Abdul Jalil. Just before I read my poem, I would like today I would like to dedicate this poem to Jessie Redmond Fawcett. This great lady of Longside who was born in our neighborhood over 100 years ago and still today shines a bright light of genius, human dignity, and personal power. Power. Not everybody has power. Not just the mental kind, but the physical too. Your character determines if you have it or not. You might just be the one to achieve it and hit the spot. Suffering and sacrifices will occur, leaving those, maybe even so much more. Split your time between work and fun, just so you'll succeed and get the job done. Don't be a follower, be a leader, because today in our lifetime, leaders are the succeeders. Not everything is gonna go your way, not everything is free, you'll have to pay. We all have hard, some hard times, but that doesn't mean we have to kill and start crimes. 
You don't have to cry and beg on your knees just to please. That's not having power. That's just being a coward. Staying home and just watching TV is not, it's not going to help you graduate and get a degree. Don't be mean. Don't be rude. Just so you can try and put people and others in a bad mood. Don't start a mess. Sit down and try and ace a test. Just keep your head high throughout all your strokes and reach for the sky. What inspired me to write this poem is that I see people who disrespect adults. Some of the kids today are being killed over the dumbest reason. Trayvon Martin is the example. An innocent kid who was killed while he was carrying iced tea and Skittles just because he looked suspicious. I wanted to bring this to other African American children who think life is easy. That's what inspired me to write this poem. much. Out of the mouth of babes. There he goes. Okay, and for the sixth and seventh grade, first place, um, Shannon Briggs, Invincible Truth. Okay, excellent. She has a representative. Let's give her a nice round of applause for standing in her stead. Shannon would have loved to have been here, but she's actually being honored for something else that she did at another place in uh, New York. And so she asked me as her teacher if I would come and read. My name is Jean Drozd, okay? Uh, her poem is called Invincible Truth. Say what you need to say when you need to say it. Speak up, be loud, be heard, be understood, speak from your heart. Speak the truth, stand up, tell the world. Speak about the lack of jobs. It's your duty to speak out. People are meant to help. It's your purpose in life. Speak about your point of view. Speak about the economy. Tell the government what to do. Write a letter, take a stand. Don't be afraid to get up in front of a crowd. Tell them how you really feel. Don't be shy, don't be timid, be free. Be true to yourself and others. Don't fear the opinions of others. Many will not judge you. Most will agree with you. Believe in yourself. Self-confidence is the key. Just be yourself. You could change the world. You could really help out if you just believe in yourself. Others won't care. They won't be upset. People enjoy some change. Always do what you feel is right. You are only as strong as you believe. When you believe, you become invincible. Never give up. Always try, try again. Yell from the rooftops. Stand up to your leaders. You have the power. The power, your power, is concealed in what you believe. Speak up. Speak the truth to everything and everyone. There, there, oops. there is a, um, there's a plaque for her. It's not here right now, but we'll, we'll ensure you get it. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eighth grade uh, division. Third place. Um, Mr. Kevin Johnson. Mr. Kevin Johnson is not here. Is there a representative for him? Teacher, mom, dad, okay. Wayne Nolasco is not here. Teacher, mom, dad, okay. First place, Victoria Gilstrap is here. There she is, with the boot on. I'm sure there's a poem somewhere about this boot she's wearing. <laughs> um, my name is Victoria Gilstrap, and the name of my poem is Power Inside Us All. As children, we were taught, taught to read, taught to write, and taught that we can do anything. But now that we are older, we back away. We fear that we do not have what it takes, that our dreams are a fantasy, that we just have to face reality. This fear, I tell you, is a mask. It hides what we are afraid to realize. 
that in all actu actuality we are powerful, powerful in ways that we cannot understand. Each of us holds this power, this power to reach our dreams, but we settle for less, because power does not come alone. With power comes the responsibility to rule with fairness, honesty, and compassion. It comes with blame and green monsters of jealousy. When you have power, people are watching, waiting for you to fall to the bottom and blame you. Why grant their wishes and not strive to be powerful? Yes, people might blame you for all you do wrong, but do not let them lose sight of all you did right. With one wrong deed, people will forget all the good deeds. Don't be like so many blinded by the power or be misled by others whom power corrupted. You gain the power because you are trustworthy and strong. People expect those in power to be perfect, but nobody is perfect. So whatever you do, keep going. Be cautious and use your power wisely. Just don't forget that you have the power to do anything and everything. Bravo, thank you very much. I hope you get better soon there, hop along. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay, we are winding down. High school division. Let's see, third place. Madison K. Madison K. Eastern Senior High. She's not here today. She's not here. Teacher, representative. Uh, yeah, I'm the teacher. You want to read a poem for her? Um, you have a, she didn't give me a copy. Is there a copy? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Okay, hey, this is called. Um, the roots of power simmer into stew. I stir behind the curtain of the smoke. Beware to all the, who drink the bubbling brew. It feeds the hungry, the forgotten few, who grasp with thirst unquenchable at straws. The roots of power simmer into stew. It fuels the rage of muddled masses who despise the rulers they will never know. Beware to all who drink the bubbling brew. It gives a voice to rebels, old and new, their bullets pounding beats beneath their cries. The roots of power simmer into stew. It seethes and slimes into a greenish glue and sticks forever in ambitious minds. Beware to all who drink the bubbling brew. They drink it wildly, putting on a crown. They drink it calmly, slipping on a noose. The roots of power simmer into stew. Beware to all who drink the bubbling brew. Did that justice, here you go. Okay. He sounds like he was born to read poetry. Indeed. All right, second place. Um, Grace Rose Eisen. Eisen, Grace Rose Eisen. They all had the prom last night. And Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm their teacher. Oh, okay. I was chaperoning the prom too, so I'm a little. Hey, and I know you must be really, really tired. Um, okay, this is called Deep Blue Free. Uh, and if Grace was here, she has a magnificent British accent. Uh, she's from, from England, uh, but I can't do this as well as she can. But uh, Deep Blue Free. My head fixed high, but body still worry. I embrace the waves that crash before me, unbalanced, unaware. I used to slink until my head felt numb, my skin blended with the sand, forming a comfort blanket, an opaque blanket, a retreating blanket of the past. I loathe the waves, let me frolic in the deep, influencing me to mature, then patronizing us with your ever-blinding regulations, contradicting, condescending, corrupt privilege, Glare at your reflection, beautiful, isn't it? But I assume you avoid mirrors altogether. Now I stand face first at 17 years old, fresh chapter unwrapped, unfolded by its accord. So I will wait. I will reveal in the shadows as I wait, K 
carelessly treading the sharp rocks tame my freedom, pushing boundaries, limitation, chains, tightening. Frustrated, I struggle to find any truth in the lies, cursing, blaring, screaming. My, shorts, my shouts have turned into that of a sailor's. Previously, like a serpent, your faith has slivered down my throat, suffocating me. Paranoia crushes down the anticipation of another dis deceitful plan. I will not conform. We will not conform. I will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. I will not be ignored. We will not be ignored. Gossipers and the lost brush past me. Their judging eye on everyone. Are you not my sister? But there is no one in reality, only a mirror. The mirror has been destroyed by colossal waves. In the past, time is the greatest of all healers, a wise man once foretold. As dawn emerges, the mirror stands tall in the sand. Bitter winds brush my pearly skin and bones. They wrap themselves, hugging my body. Changing winds jolt me with every gust. Sometimes dark clouds amalgamate with the clarity above. Sharp winds graze these limbs. The sea's salty perfume smothering me. Will you stretch out a hand, or are we all just survivors? When we were young, we would care and share with the most foreigners, see the world through rose-tinted glasses, never looking over the ocean, only at the white water. Perhaps we were naive, perhaps immature, perhaps we were unblemished. Now the waves tear down much stronger. Now we have built ourselves much stronger. In our sacrifice, our, tr our trust, is much tougher. I am in my own faith, and my own faith is in me, wandering half blinded by the sunshine into the abyss, aware of the charlatans, fiends, and quacks, aware of the ones who once strangled me, knowing that to some, trust is only a word. I am not afraid, even though my bones often differ. Storms, tempests, hurricanes swallow me whole. My generation are not children anymore. We will be seen and heard. For our child's sake, we shall step up now. Strike me with your stereotypes. Beat me with your self-importance. But we will all together return the fire. And uh, for, uh, for historical purposes, would you say your name and? Uh, this, I, I'm Mr. Bound, Walter Bound. Uh, I read for uh, Grace Eisen uh, at Eastern High School. Thank you. And her poem was uh, Deep Blue Free. What a trooper he is. Yes. That's a good teacher there. Yes. All right. And um, our first place uh, winner for high schools is uh, Ian Eichen. Eichen. Oh, he's here. Ian. All right. Ian. There you go. And there you go. Uh, I'm Ian Eichen. This is Let's Play Monopoly. Uh, Let's Play Monopoly. The game is slated. The ash of wealthy Cuban cigars trickle down as our money should. You cannot occupy here. There is no chance card or pass and go. All the houses are all bought, and there are no numbers left to roll. We are all just stuck in jail, and we can't seem to roll doubles. Gordon Gecko isn't fiction anymore. The figures of movies are coming true. Long past are men who had a dream or would go hungry for someone else. Now everyone is just lining up to the Moloch that we know. Bring back the free thinkers, Emerson and Thoreau. Everyone is just drones to the big brothers of power and business. Slaves to the cash we crave, or well let them free. The candidates today have lobbyist hands in their pocket. They may skulk behind the scenes of the political campaign, but it's lobbyists who are the ones who will shape our world. We no longer vote for people. It feels we never have. Questioning those in power is impossible when power wears earplugs. They cannot hear our shouts or cries. Instead, we vote for clouded figures that pull their own ideals ahead of ours. Slowly but surely, our economy dies. What happened to the land I knew? The land not divided by red or blue. A state held together by a common goal. Now our votes do not even poll. We may as well just sit at home and grab the board games off the shelf. Come sit down, let's play Monopoly. All right, Ian. So Ian, hold on for a minute. Yeah. You know, Ian, I like Ian's style. Ian 
has flipped the script, so to say. He didn't get dressed up to read his poetry. He's like, I'm a jock who reads poetry. That's cool. All right, Ian. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> That's right. Jocks read poems, too. Yes. Poetry is for everyone. All right, so um, I think that concludes our um, presentation. Can, we, can I get all of the um, uh, winners who's present to come forward with your awards? Um, I think that might, be, that might make a good. And breathe. <laughs> All right, let's give him another round of applause. Good job, everybody. Well, we have come to the point for our closing remark to the program, and I am Linda Shockley. I'm the president of the Lawnside Historical Society. We are very grateful, again, to the New Jersey Council for the Humanities for funding this program. You should have received or you can pick up a survey form that we need to complete to complete our report to the Council for the Humanities about this program. The idea being that they want to evaluate the program and hopefully see that this is something that they should continue to fund for some, some time to come. We're very happy also to be supported by the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission. Sandra Turner Barnes, who's the executive director was not able to be with us today, but this is the fourth consecutive year that the County Heritage Commission has funded the Jesse Redmond Fawcett Celebration and the Poetry Competition. We also got support from the Delta Sigma Theta, a New Jersey Garden City alumni mm -hmm. chapter. Uh, that sorority was Jesse Redmond Fawcett's sorority. So we're very thankful for them. This is the first time that they've actually supported us. I would just like to congratulate all of the winners, all of the students who participated. We had 94 entries. I'd particularly like to thank Ms. Barnes for judging on the elementary level and Napalm for judging the high school level students. There's a lot of poems to read and evaluate and I think they did a wonderful job. And once again, they did it blindly. They only had the numbers um, that we assigned to the poems. They didn't have the the um, names of the students or the schools they attended. I'd really like to commend the students for looking at this theme when we came up with Speaking Truth to Power. Someone said, well, that's kind of a difficult concept. You're really going to have to explain that extensively for especially fifth graders to gasp, grasp that. But um, as Napalm said out of the mouths of babes, students are quite capable of relating to complex topics like this. And we've seen it over and over in the past several years. So we just really applaud the students. And we also thank the teachers who really support the project and get their students to participate, encourage them, and inspire them. Teachers of the Historical Society, um, Joyce Fowler, our vice president, uh, opened our program today. Uh, Mr. Higgs, we know, is our Peter Mott reenactor. Um, Christine Lewis Coker is our treasurer. Our financial secretary, Gloria Goodman, is not here today. Our recording secretary, uh, Chris Butler, is also not here. And our corresponding secretary, Maddie Warren, uh, is also not here. She was here briefly, but she's gone now. We just thank all of them for all their hard work related to putting this program together. I also want to acknowledge our board members, uh, John Latney, who is here. It's so good to see him. Has been a board member and a life member of the Historical Society. And Sharon King, who is also here as a member and a new member of our board. So we thank them all for being here. So join us for refreshments. You can always uh, get in touch with the Historical Society through our website, www.petermotthouse.org, and we hope you'll come and visit the Mott House every Saturday between noon and 3. We are open, and uh, group tours and school tours are available 
by appointment. So uh, get in touch with us on the website or call our phone number and Mrs. Fowler or somebody will get back to you. Thank you so very much.